Ooh, be weary through the night. Rummaging across the halls of the YouTube building, you may come across the rally cat sleeping in his abode. Do not wake him, or if you do, he will talk about scary games. It's finally the Halloween season. Look, you want to get scared? What game do you go to? Oh, I got a few for you. We'll start with the easy one. We got Slender. That's a good one. Nice, simple, easy to understand. Grab the eight pages and you're free. It's a classic. <laughs> Slender, the arrival. Okay, that's interesting. Taking the original, add some lore to it. That's pretty creepy. Kid gets lost and you go and look for him only to find out that you're walking in the footsteps of someone who just got fucking cooked like Armin. Look, I used to be obsessed with Slenderman back in the day. Um, I used to think he was real. <laughs> but it, I like the objective, but I, I don't want them to remake it or anything like that. But what, what, what else we got? What else we got? Resident Evil. That's been pretty popping lately with the mama with the big hudunka boingas, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's pretty dope. It's got some creepy lore exposition in it. The gameplay isn't only narrative based, but it's got some pretty fucking epic gamer moments in it. Pretty spooky, right? What else we got? Let's see. Um, Dead Space. I fucking love Dead Space and they're fucking remaking it. God damn. I'm excited for that. Sort of with the whole survive in space sort of vibe. It's got some pretty outrageous gore to like add on to the horror factor. It's fucking dope. Now, what do all these games have in common? I'm sure you can answer that for yourself. Dark aesthetic? Sinister tones? Survival based? Hell yeah. These are just some of the many games you might turn to to get scared. But then we got... <gasps> Five Nights at Freddy's! Ha 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 ha! <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Now, before we get into the main topic of the video, I love Halloween. And with Halloween comes spooky shit. I love spooky shit. Movies like Alien, Sinister, Friday the 13th. Movies like that. I fucking love them. And I watched a lot of that stuff with my dad growing up. And it even went to the point where I was literally looking up scary videos on YouTube. And like ghost sightings caught on camera. I know they're fucking fake, but just the mere thought of them existing kind of gives me goosebumps, and I like being scared by stuff like that. And I like to think that's more of a common thing than people think it is. But I often hear people criticizing horror media that uses jump scares as being cheap, overdone, and not scary. And while I kind of disagree with the criticism, I also kind of agree with the criticism. I just sort of feel like you have to be in that mood to be scared. Like you gotta want to be scared, you know what I'm saying? For me, it's that I love immersing myself in that environment of whatever scary media I'm consuming. So I like being scared. Think of it like a roller coaster. I like getting over sort of that suspense, even though there's no physical danger with video games or movies. I like putting myself in that headspace. I, I don't know why, I just do. But when it comes to FNAF, as a 14, 15 year old kid, you bet your ass I was jumping when Freddy Fart Bear jumped my ass on night four. Oh no, Teddy Bear, what do I do? You must survive. Survive the five nights and you win. That is Five Nights at Freddy's. And this game is nothing short of a gamermatic masterpiece. So here you are stuck as a night security guard working the third shift at this stupid ass pizza place for kids for what you know that whole joke that people like to make with horror games where it's like oh why is he here just get up and leave or why did he apply to this job it's clearly a shitty job or like just punch the scary thing that'll help basically a lot of them don't have a clear-cut story they're just there to scare you the game is just meant to scare you like Slender, what's the reason you're in the forest? I don't know, you're just there to collect the pages and to be scared, that's it. And I think FNAF did this too when it first came out, but I think they did it correctly because nobody knew about the story when it first came out. But as people learned, it grew more depth and it wasn't as shallow as something like Slender or 
another game like that that was just made to scare you just for gameplay's sake. You know, there's a reason this guy is at this shitty job doing what he's doing. And I don't mean to knock people who make those jokes, um, but I just like knowing that there's a reason and an extra layer behind the fact that you're in this place. And there's a canonical explanation for the question, why is this guy here? As I was saying before, Five Nights at Freddy's has the ability to make it seem like it's a shallow game, just like Slender or something like that. A lot of the little details for the lore are very ambiguous and they can go right over your head. The little creepy details in the game can just be written off as it just being a scary game and nothing else. But as most of you guys are definitely aware, there's not a single detail in the game that goes unexplained. Every detail has a reason for it being there beyond the initial ruse of it just being a scary game. And you're probably thinking, hey yo Clambo, we already know about this shit, shut the fuck up. Yeah? So what? You tell me if you can find another game that puts this much emphasis in every little detail for an immersive horror experience. Ah, Doki Doki Literature Club. The atmosphere, the clever ruse it tried to pull to make you think it was a cute little dating sim. Each little creepy detail that was made to throw you off just a little bit from your train of thought up until the big reveal. Bruh. And then you go through it all again just to have it mess you up. This game is beautifully crafted and probably won't work again the second time if Dan Salvato tries to make another game series just like this. The lack of control you have when it comes to both of these games is what makes the scary game recipe taste so good. In FNAF, you're locked into one location and you could turn left and you could turn right, but that's the extent of the movements. The only form of control you really had was that you could close the doors, check the cameras, and turn the lights on and off. But with that, form of control, there was a clear consequence. You used the doors, the lights, or the camera, and you used up your power gauge much quicker. You sacrificed your time for more safety. That's the mindset you had when the game first came out. Now, this game's been out for a while now, so people are already numb to the whole FNAF 1 jump scares in the atmosphere, so playing it doesn't really elicit the same sort of fight or flight response that it used to. But like I said, I'm talking about more so the feelings I had when I played it when it first came out. As I mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to be immersed into and scared by this game. So that level of safety I had when controlling the doors was real and not washed away and desensitized by the six year lifespan. That's how most scary games tend to be when it's, you know, past a few years over its lifespan. But FNAF takes a more direct approach when trying to scare its audience, similar to most other horror games. But this game took a different approach, which I could argue made the game popular and it was successful in five nights at freddy's you expect to be scared but in doki doki literature club you didn't expect shit out of it not in like a bad way you just didn't expect to be scared or at least i didn't so luckily for your boy i got the perfect experience with this game i fell under that ruse that it was a typical dating sim because i was going through this fucking cringy ass weeaboo waifu phase think fuck i'm over that but when I played it, I obviously noticed the sort of small buildups over time during the game that made it scary. And then when I got to the part, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. I then realized how little control I had as a player and technically as a part of the game. Yeah, for those who somehow don't know much about this game, you are canon. Because yeah, to add another depth to the creepiness, you yourself are a part of the game. Technically, not you as the character, you as you. You're a part of the game. In this game, it's literally a graphic novel giving the illusion of control or choice or, you know, choosing a different path. Only to find out that Monica was behind everything. <laughs> she was the one that was breaking the fourth wall and talking to you as the person and not the character. Messing with your game files and shit and involving you going into the Steam client to delete her file. I'm sure like many people playing this game, it creeped you the fuck out. It creeped me the fuck out. I can't imagine how I'd react playing it as like a kid. But looking back at it, there were so many details that really sold it as being this fabricated world made by just Monica. Obviously, I ain't no game developer, but I feel like a lot of this stuff 
would be stuff that would be on my mind if I was. And I'm sure it's stuff that all game developers have to think about. And I feel like every horror game developer should strive for that level of detail in their horror game. And I'm not saying they have to follow the same formula, I'm not saying they have to break the fourth wall, or they have to subvert expectations. They just gotta SCARE YOU! Every horror game's different. I'll take Resident Evil for an example. That game is a game that relies on its atmosphere definitely. It follows the whole undead, mutated creature trope that seems to have died off within the past 10 years or so, but something that's kept the game series alive is its story, and more importantly, I think, the characters. I mean, look at this bozo. If you're a gamer in any sense, most any sense, you look at him and you know he's from Resident Evil. And that's what Capcom have done to help make this franchise last for as long as it has. And if you take these three horror-themed games and put them together, the things you'll find that are the same about them are that they have memorable characters. All three of them being successful in their own ways. So we talked about Resident Evil and Doki Doki Literature Club for a couple minutes. Let's jump back to Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> the absolute icon status that these characters have is second to none when it comes to scary games. Freddy fucking Fazbear. You know who that is. The way Scott Cawthon designed these characters is borderline genius. They're cute enough for kids to love them, but at the same time, they're still just a little bit enough to be very unsettling. And not only are the characters from the first game such iconic beings, each game is iconic and distinguishable from one another, both character design wise and mechanics wise. All right, let's look at this shit. Call of Duty, which one's which? Eh, wrong, now, Five Nights at Freddy's. Which one's which? Oh, uh, do, 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 do. Easy. Each one of the games is distinguishable from one another. Now, could I actually tell you the difference between all the Call of Duty games? Probably. I mean, I've been playing them long enough. But it's easier for me to identify each FNAF game. And that's because with each iteration, Scott Cawthon kept changing it up a bit. After the first game, they were like, yeah, remember that little bit of control you had with closing the doors? Yeah, fuck you! And they took it away. They said, all right, open the doors, and you're fighting against all these fucking animatronics. Oh yeah, and here, here's a little plastic helmet. Here, here, here you go. Here, take that. That'll protect you from... <gasps> Don't Chica! But she is such a bad bitch, though. Yeah, I know, that's what I'm saying. But the good thing is that you didn't have to worry about the power. Sort of. That was the give and take. But then, in FNAF 3, you go against probably one of the most iconic horror game characters made. Springtrap. And you find out that it's just him. And it was kind of a relief based off of the second game. But then it's like, ah, fuck, I gotta deal with all this shit now. I did like this game, but I will say it wasn't my favorite one. Although the premise was creepy, and it was something about it just being only one animatronic after you instead of a bunch that just made it that much more creepy to me. But the next game, this game is my shit. The trailer came out and I was already fucking hooked. Like, this shit was so cool. I love the way these animatronics look. They look so gnarly and it just looks so sick. And in this, it was no power gauge, no HUDs, no cameras, no vents, no switches, no nothing that you had to open up. It was just you in your room having to fend off these fucking giant hunks of metal but in this game it was less focused on your vision and more focused on your auditory capability if you hear the motherfuckers mouth breathing in the hallway then you keep the fucking door shut but as a whole the game kind of just had a sort of finality to the whole franchise with it being the original four animatronics for most of the game and then you had fredbear or golden freddy and then you had this black air force energy type dude who 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 was he but the game made a good Final chapter, if you will. <laughs> but then... Nobody saw this coming. I didn't see this coming. Fucking Markiplier didn't see this coming. Nobody did. This was the supposed final chapter, but I guess it was just the final chapter of the original saga. This game was probably the most polarizing to me as a <laughs> FNAF fan, because there was some good and there was some bad. And I guess that's what you get for taking some risks. 
one of the bad things in my opinion was the voice acting. I was not a huge fan of the voice acting in this game. For a game that thrived on ambiguity, it felt odd hearing people talk about what was going on. Well, they were kind of talking about it. It was kind of just a... Uh, ice cream. It's kind of like Lego Star Wars. Back then, it didn't have any voice acting, and that was part of its charm. But they started adding voice acting in it. It's just weird, because the humor behind it was, we know what they're saying, but they're just saying it like... Wah, 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 wah. But when you add the voice acting, it sort of takes away from that imagination. How did my father die? So, you seriously think I'm gonna buy this game? You're damn fucking right I am. Doesn't mean I have to like the voice acting. I've always liked Lego Star Wars. Just like I've always liked Five Nights at Freddy's. But along with the voice acting, there was a clear tonal shift that came with the fifth game after the original saga. Now, I haven't talked about the lore much in this video, because quite frankly, I don't have the credentials to talk about it because it's so confusing. But I'm going to talk about it briefly and I'm going to compare it to another storyline that is very near and dear to my heart. You start out with the four main animatronics and it's a horror survival game. The original saga is about a man who murders children. He stuffs the children in the animatronics, but the animatronics, you know, they try to haunt him. The murderer, William Afton, gets caught, but he jumps into a fucking animatronic suit, almost kills himself, but he doesn't. And now he's just there wandering around. That is the simplest bare minimum state that the story is about. And that's up until probably FNAF 4. But then from sister location on, shit starts to get fucking wild. You get shit like Remnant, which is a metal that's cast to hold children's souls. And then you jump from that to the original child murderer, William Afton, being digitally represented as a virus and him trying to start a cult. Like, what the fuck? That's a big ass jump. Like, shit got crazy. But I guess when you're making a story this long, you got to think of some unpredictable ideas. And uh, let me tell you, nobody was going to predict that. I guarantee you nobody would have predicted that. And as I was mentioning, I want to compare that to another storyline near and dear to my heart. The fucking zombie storyline. From World at War to probably, I would say, Black Ops 1. Maybe the beginning of Black Ops 2. It's just a survival-based game. With the four main characters, Dempsey, Richtofen, Nikolai, and Takio. And Richtofen being the head honcho, trying to get the other guys to follow his plan to fucking blow up the earth. It's not exactly the most tame storyline, but... It's pretty tame compared to what it turns into, I would say. Later, from Black Ops 2 to Black Ops 3 and 4, you get Cthulhu, you get dragons, you get self-murdering, you get giant robots. Like, where the fuck did this shit come from? Was it cool? Yeah. But where did it come from? It's probably something that both of these writers had issues with when making their story. They just kept getting bigger, bigger, bigger. bigger. Perfect. Although with zombies, I sort of stopped getting interested in it around Black Ops 4. I mean, I kind of had been playing it for a decade, so I mean, that's probably why. But Five Nights at Freddy's, I'm still pretty interested in. Especially with games like Pizzeria Simulator and Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted. Man, I think that game is the perfect template for a VR game. A VR horror game, that is. I'm fucking hella excited to see this new iteration of Five Nights at Freddy's. And I like that it's doing something for itself yet again to make this game stand out from the rest. And as I mentioned before, I think that's super important for the horror game genre. I love the characters. And like a lot of you guys, I spent my formative years theorizing and playing these games. It's helped me become closer with people like my sister. Literally fucking day and night going over theories, writing theories on the wall, creating the timeline based on what we thought the game was about. So I guess you could say the franchise is pretty important to me. It went from being this small indie game with literally one person behind it to being one of the biggest trailers from the fucking one PlayStation reveal. It also went from being one of those franchises with a childlike audience in the beginning and it was somewhat embarrassing to say that you liked it. It went from that to being something that everyone is interested in. Even the people that are grown up that have 
watched so many theory videos in the past. Shit, that's how it was for me. I watched this shit when I was a kid and I guess I just grew up. And that's why I'm super excited to see what this generation of Five Nights at Freddy's has in store. You know, because growing up is a little interesting. There's a lot of things that you just don't find as exciting anymore as you did when you were younger. There's a lot of things that you don't have time to get excited for. And you just get overwhelmed with responsibilities and all that stuff. And it's, it's a little sad. But this is one of the things that I'm definitely still excited about. And uh, I expect to make a fucking second video, follow-up video talking about the new game that comes out. Like, what's going to happen? This is How will it connect to the original games? But this is the end of the video. Thank you guys for watching so much. Um, this video wound up being a bit more of a commentary than a boom, boom, punch joke uh, sort of deal. I mean, it still has that in it, but it's a bit more of a commentary than I thought it would than I thought it would be. But I appreciate you sticking around, watching, and listening. And it's fucking Halloween. Thank fuck. I fucking hate the summertime. I love the the fourth quarter of the year. I fucking love it because it gives me so much more motivation. I hate the heat. I love when it starts getting cool out, I get to wear more fits. I just, in general, the attitude is so much better. Um, but look forward to more shit towards the end of the year, more streams, possibly another video. I got a couple video ideas down the pipeline, but man, life hits different when you get to the end of the year. At least for me, it does. Um, but shit, I guess that's the rest of the video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Your boy Clambo is out of here. See ya. And have a very spooky Halloween.